What's up, cool people? I'm Matt Conroy. Welcome back to more Bible reading. So, today we've got Genesis chapter 21. Um, yeah, so last time we had a whole big hullabaloo, which seemed awfully familiar <laughs> regarding um, Abraham and Sarah going somewhere, I guess, yeah, and, and then, like, having the whole, oh, just tell them you're my sister, because uh, otherwise they might try and kill me to marry you. Yeah, um, but anyway, all right, let's just hop right into this. This is not exactly a short chapter. So, Genesis 21, verse 1. The Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. She became pregnant, and she gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened at just the time God said it would. And Abraham named their son Isaac. Eight days after Isaac was born, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded. Abraham was a hundred years old when Isaac was born. Um, so I think we had already mentioned before about the name Isaac essentially meaning like laughter or perhaps more accurately, he laughs because really both Abraham and Sarah had kind of laughed at the idea of having a son in their old age. But, well... <laughs> Turns out it was true. God didn't lie. God does not lie. And so here they are having a son. And just like God said, they named him Isaac. Um, maybe it's just, I, I got to imagine that serves as like a constant reminder of a, how they doubted God, and B, on a more positive note, just the unexpected joy that they got from having a son in their old age. Anyway, uh, verse 6, And Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter. All who hear about this will laugh with me. Who would have thought, or sorry, <laughs> Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse a baby? Yet I have given Abraham a son in his old age. So, more on the previous point that I just made. Um, I assume the asterisk is, yeah, talking about the meaning of the name Isaac and whatnot. Anyway, uh, let's just move on to verse 8. When Isaac grew up and was about to be weaned, Abraham prepared a huge feast to celebrate the occasion. But Sarah saw Ishmael, the son of Abraham and her Egyptian servant Hagar, making fun of her son Isaac. So she turned to Abraham and demanded, Get rid of that slave woman and her son. He is not going to share the inheritance with my son Isaac. I won't have it. So, again, some tension between... Uh, Sarah and Hagar. There was tension before, shortly after Hagar got pregnant with Ishmael. And here it's coming up again. Um, so verse 9 had a little asterisk. The original... Maybe not original, original version, but... Um, so the Latin Vulgate, which is one of the old texts that, you know, the Bible is kind of originally translated from, uh, mentions, or like, it doesn't include the part about, you know, of her son Isaac. So I guess it would have just said making fun at that point rather than specifically 
saying they were making fun of her son Isaac. So it could have been of Isaac. It could have been of Sarah. But <laughs> I mean, in any case, the the point is Hagar and Ishmael were like poking fun at or otherwise insulting Sarah and or Isaac. And yeah, you know, it didn't exactly look great. They they weren't exactly getting along. But anyway, uh, verse 11. This upset Abraham very much because Ishmael was his son. But God told Abraham, Do not be upset over the boy and your servant. Do whatever Sarah tells you, for Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. But I will also make a nation of the descendants of Hagar's son, because he is your son too. Okay, so Abraham didn't like the fact of Sarah wanting to kick out Ishmael, his other son. Uh, but, you know, things weren't going to go very well if they stayed. So God tells Abraham, yeah, don't, don't worry don't worry about Ishmael. He's he's going to do just fine. So go ahead and just do what Sarah asks. Uh, verse 14. So Abraham got up early the next morning, prepared food and a container of water, and strapped them on Hagar's shoulders. Then he sent her away with their son, and she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water was gone, she put the boy in the shade of a bush. Then she went and sat down by herself about a hundred yards away. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said, as she burst into tears. So, I mean, it seemed like everything was going to be fine. This doesn't make it look like that. But, uh, we do know, uh... God is in the habit of making seemingly impossible situations turn out okay. Um, and I assume... Oh, so instead of about a hundred yards, the original Hebrew says a bow shot. Um, I don't know if that was a kind of just rough estimated measurement that was generally assumed to be about a certain length. In, in Hebrew, um, but in any case, uh, you know, the, the one of the things about this translation is that it seems to prefer, you know, when, when possible, kind of giving more precise measurements and or more understandable measurements, at least for uh, English language readers, if not even more specifically American readers. So it, that's just one of the things that I would say about this translation. It, it, it probably makes it a better one to to teach from, especially teaching, you know, kids, students, Basically, I I feel like this is one of the easier translations to understand everything that you know all of the words that you read. But anyway, I won't digress on that point too long. In any case, um, so Hagar and Ishmael are sent away. They they wander around in the wilderness for a while, um, and then they run out of their water and supplies, and so. Hagar's like, well, great. This is this is just lovely. We're going to die out here, but I don't want to see I don't want to see my son die. It's too much for me to take. So I'm just going to go over here away from him. Anyway, verse 17. But God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven. Hagar, what's wrong? Do not be afraid. 
God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him and comfort him, for I will make a great nation from his descendants. Then God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well full of water. She quickly filled her water container and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy as he grew up in the wilderness. He became a skillful archer, and he settled in the wilderness of Paran. His mother arranged for him to marry a woman from the land of Egypt. So, as mentioned, God has a habit of making bad and even seemingly impossible situations turn out okay. Not that that happens all the time, but, uh, you know, God wasn't going to go back on his promise here. So, in essence, everything does turn out okay. Um, the, the, turns out there was a well not too far from them. And, and, you know, they got by okay. They found more water. And I guess the last couple verses there are talking about just Ishmael being able to, you know, grow up and, you know, make a living and do well for himself. But now we get to verse 22. Uh, about this time, Abimelech came with Phicol, his army commander, to visit Abraham. God is obviously with you, helping you in everything you do, Abimelech said. Swear to me in God's name that you will never deceive me, my children, or any of my descendants. I have been loyal to you, so now swear that you will be loyal to me and to this country where you are living as a foreigner. Okay, so... <laughs> that's part of the reason for bringing up the previous situation with Abimelech, so we have some context for their relationship and why he would be saying to Abraham, look, I I've, I've treated you well. Please... Just do me a favor. Treat me well back. Uh, verse 24. Abraham replied, Yes, I swear to it. Then Abraham complained to Abimelech about a well that Abimelech's servants had taken by force from Abraham's servants. This is the first I've heard of it, Abimelech answered. I have no idea who's responsible. You have never complained about this before. Okay, so, a little bit of a problem with Abimelech's servants taking something that was Abraham's, or at least belonged to Abraham's servants. It's not really clear how widespread <laughs> Abraham and his family and servants and, you know, livestock and all that were. Um, so, you know, depending on how much land and space that took up, it's, you know, it, it seems like there might have been somewhat of almost like a, a, a boundary dispute and, you know, people wondering, okay, well, is this ours? Is this yours? You know what? This is close enough. I feel like we should be able to use this. But then, you know, Abraham's servants are like, no, this is ours. Why Why are you trying to take f from us? But anyway, um, verse 27. Abraham then gave some of his sheep, goats, and cattle to Abimelech, and they made a treaty. But Abraham also took seven additional female lambs and set them off by themselves. Abimelech asked, Why have you set these seven apart from the others? Abraham replied, Please accept these seven lambs to show your agreement that I dug this well. Gotta turn the page here. Then he named the place Beersheba, which means well of the oath, because... 
that was because that was where they had sworn the oath. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I had a little difficulty reading that sentence at first. So that kind of explains the you know the naming of a certain location. Didn't it mention Beersheba? Yeah. It said Beersheba was where Hagar and Ishmael wandered. So, like, is it, is it the same place? Or are there multiple? Like, due to the naming conventions, <laughs> it's possible there could have been more than one place with the same name. <laughs> and I'm just now realizing this. But at the same time, uh, like, if that is the same place, though, then that kind of speaks more so to my previous thought, question, wondering about how widespread Abraham's, you know, land and belongings were. Because... Because if that was the place, if that was the same place that Hagar and Ishmael were wandering around and, you know, kind of wondering if they were going to even continue to live, then, like, geez. <laughs> I mean, it, it clearly had to be far enough away from Abraham himself that they e even wondered, you know... That, that, that they assumed they couldn't just, you know, go back, ask him for some more stuff or whatever. I don't know. In any case, quite a ways. But, um, so anyway, back to what's actually going on here. Um, so Ab Abraham and Abimelech kind of strike a deal. Abraham gets to keep the well, I presume, uh, and he gives some of his livestock to Abimelech. And the well gets named Beersheba because they, that was where they kind of made their oath agreement. Anyway, almost done. Verse 32. After making their covenant at Beersheba, Abimelech left with Phicol, the commander of his army, and they returned home to the land of the Philistines. Then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba, and there he worshipped the Lord, the eternal God. And Abraham lived as a foreigner in Philistine country for a long time. Because you got to remember, this is not in Canaan. This is... Um, they had moved south to the Negev back in chapter 20. Uh, and moved on from there further south, I guess. Uh, but, so, so Abraham actually wasn't living in his own, you know, he wasn't living in Canaan at the time. He was not, you know, in the promised land. <laughs> he had moved elsewhere, which is, I guess, why there was, you know, all, all the more reason and likelihood for the conflict over, you know, land and what belonged to who. But Abraham had kind of settled in a spot and, you know, dug up his own well there. But that, that was the point of contention because... You know, he was a foreigner. Others may have lived at least nearby before. So anyway, um, I, I guess that makes, you know, the tension, the confusion, that whole situation a lot more understandable. <laughs> Remembering that Abraham is not just, you know, in his own place. He's living apparently within the general territory of the Philistines. So, anyway. 
Uh, that does it for this chapter. Um, don't know if I really have any additional thoughts to add. Um, I mean, it's it just says at the end, he lived as a foreigner in Philistine country for a long time. So, I don't know for sure if that's where he's going to live until he dies, essentially, or... Because that would maybe explain a little bit why he's not, you know, in the promised land, and later on why his descendants eventually have to return back to the promised land. I don't know. Anyway... I won't think too far ahead on this, and I'll just leave that as it is. But uh, a lot of the a lot of this stuff is important to keep in mind, especially the you know details regarding where people are living and what they're doing and things like that. Because as we saw with you know Abraham and Abimelech, these things tend to come up later, <laughs> and you know. If you don't know or recall what happened previously, it's more difficult to understand, you know, the context for the current situation, you know, as we read through the Bible. But anyway, uh, that's that's going to do it for now. Um, as always, like the video if you enjoyed it, share it with others if you want them to see uh, subscribe to my channel to see more stuff from me and click that notification bell to get updates when I post new videos. That way you can see all of this Bible reading stuff, all of my other videos, if you're interested. Um, also, you can take a look down in the description for info on my other social media pages and how to find and follow all those. Um, and of course, leave your comments down below all that with any thoughts that you have. So yeah, that's it. Hope you're all doing well. Hopefully I will see you for the next video, or at least the next chapter of this. But whatever the case is, until next time, stay cool, people.